Welcome to Planet Geo, the podcast where we talk about our amazing planet, how it works, and why it matters to you. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Jesse? Oh, man, I'm doing really well. I'm excited for yeah, today's excited. episode, to be honest with you. But before we get to that, let's do some brief introductions. You are Chris Bullheis, a nationally recognized earth science teacher from the great state of Michigan. And you are Jesse Rymink, one of my former students, now a professor of geoscience at Penn State. And this is Planet Geo, a podcast where we talk about amazing aspects of our planet and why it matters to our everyday lives. All right. All right. Well, hey, let's uh, let's go ahead and get this episode started. What are we talking about this week, Jesse? Oh, man, we are talking about Yellowstone National Park, which is near and dear to both of our hearts. Um, it is. Let's do it. Yellowstone National Park. Yeah. So what and where is Yellowstone, Jess? Where, where, where is it? Yeah, well, we're talking about uh, National Park in uh, in the northwest corner of Wyoming. So, you know, it gets a lot of visitors. I think it's probably when you think of the U.S. as an as an internet as a, someone uh, who's not an American citizen, you kind of think of Yellowstone National Park. You know, you see the pictures of the bison, you see the geysers. It's very popular, but a lot of people who go there, you know, kind of just drive through, hang out on the boardwalk for a little bit, and don't really mm-hmm. sort of get the full yeah. experience. So I think the statistic is ninety seven percent of the people that go to Yellowstone um, don't ever leave the boardwalk. Wow. That's an that's, amazing statistic. That is an amazing statistic. I mean, so, I guess there are boardwalks everywhere, so you can see a lot and stay on the boardwalk, but you can. it's still, uh, you know, it's still, you know, it's good to get off the boardwalk and, and sort of go check other stuff out, right? Right. Correct. Um, yeah. You bet. So yeah, we're going to talk about the park. We, you know, it's near, it's near and dear to both of us in some ways. Um, we've got a long history of going there in part because of, or mostly because of the Summer Science Institute trip that is a field trip that you've led for a long time and that your dad Mm -hmm. taught and my dad taught i went um, on the class when you were teaching it i took this class so you were teaching me you know about geology in yellowstone and it's really i think one of the places that uh it really kind of struck struck home you know what the geosciences are and how interesting they are so yeah yellowstone is my my favorite place to take kids to teach um there's just (laughs) you can't go wrong in Yellowstone, there's so much diversity. There's you got the geology, you got the biology. It's everywhere. Um, it is. I think it's easily my favorite place to teach. It's a beautiful place, and it's really special. I think from a historical perspective. I know you're a great lover of history as well, as am I. And you know, Yellowstone was the United States' first national park, and arguably uh, one of the first national park in the world. Um, and it's just such a cool idea, you know that that. Um, this is a, a piece of really exceptional property that we, the people, own. And, and whether you're rich or poor or, you know, no matter your skin color, or your background or your political beliefs, you, you kind of own, in a way, a piece of this property. And you can go hang out and it's going to be well taken care for. And, and you can all go appreciate a little piece uh, of the world that's still pretty wild and still pretty that's cool. Right. Jesse, can you tell us then what your favorite aspect to Yellowstone National Park is when you visit? What gets you going with Yellowstone? Yeah, I mean, it's just such an amazing outdoor experience, I think, or a sort of amazing place to experience the, the science and, and the outside. I, we were both raised by high school biology teachers. Um, I had your dad when I was a student. I had my dad as well, and I think you, you did the same. So we both you know, have, have these longstanding family debates about the bio, biological sciences or the geosciences, which one is better, right? Um, and, and sort of can go home and argue with our, with our fathers about that. But... I mean, Yellowstone has exceptionally cool biology. Uh, you it know, does. the wildlife there is amazing. The, you know, the bacteria and all this stuff growing in the hot springs. I mean, it's super cool, right? Super yeah, cool stuff. Yeah, it is. Um, and so there's, and there's a lot of very interesting ongoing problems there that I think you can allude to, that you can, you can talk about a little bit. Absolutely. The, the biology of the park is absolutely phenomenal. And, and my teaching partner is a geologist. I'm a geologist. And so, you know, the, the course is heavy into the geology side. But when you're in Yellowstone, you can't uh, avoid the biology. There are just some really interesting things. Um, and one of these is the lake trout problem. In 1994, um, somebody very, very deliberately planted lake trout in Yellowstone Lake. And uh, lake trout, this this is a you know a major problem because the so, lake trout eat the cutthroat trout. And Yellowstone Lake is is a big lake, you know, right? Kind of it's right smack dab in the middle of the park. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Yes, correct. But the, the lake trout feed on the cutthroat trout, um, and the cutthroat trout every fall spawn up river, and that's what the grizzly bears 
used to use to fatten themselves up. And, and this is, it's put a stress on that part of the ecosystem. Um, and and it kind of disrupted the whole food chain, right? You know, since the early 2000s is spending just massive amounts of money netting uh, and killing the lake trout. They're invasive, uh, trying to get them out of there. Um, mm. and, and so this is, this is an ongoing project. I mean, up until like even five years ago, uh, they didn't know if they were going to win the battle. I mean, they oh, just, right? they kept, wow. yeah, but they, they kept on netting more fish and more fish every, every season oh, they would net more. And, and they just thought, well, you know, we're at, we're at a really crucial point now, since then they, they believe that they've turned the corner and that they're, they're winning the battle. They're catching less and less and less now, but this is going to be an ongoing problem. You know, the, unless they find a way to eradicate all of the lake trout without harming anything else, uh, they're going to have to net fish for the duration of Yellowstone National Park, which is just that it's an amazing problem. Yeah, all because, you know, somebody once upon a time put some fish in there thinking, oh, <laughs> yeah, this is a great... Hell? <laughs> I know it's it's a lake you look at. I mean, I, I'm a big fisherman. You look at it. You look at it. You're like, oh, there's this is going to be good fishing down in this lake, right? But um, you know, they thought they could make it a little bit better or something, or perhaps. Or I, that's that's what I think. Like, who knows? Look at this and say, I really want to fish lake trout. I come here every summer, and dang it, I want to I want to fish right. lake trout out of Yellowstone Lake. You know, so like, let's just okay, put there. there you go, right? I don't yeah, know. and I don't know whatever, what you know, however many millions guessing. of dollars later, we're right. still, you know, the, the right. park is oh, still yeah. trying to get rid of this. Yeah, I mean, what a, what a massive problem. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that we talk about um, that is just really a, a fascinating thing, and it's very controversial, this is the reintroduction of the wolves. In 1995, oh, yeah. they reintroduced the wolves in Yellowstone National Park. Um, and, and the thing, Yellowstone is, it's not a zoo. I mean, the, these animals are, are free to come and go as they, as they please. And so they reintroduced them into Yellowstone, but obviously then they're going to, wolves migrate, they move, yeah. you know. And, and so that created a, a firestorm in the surrounding communities in both Wyoming and Montana. And, and Idaho, actually, too. Um, and so, well, I mean, it's but, a complicated problem, right? You have people at uh, the cattle ranches or whatever, where their livelihoods are being affected by, you know, this reintroduction of wolves or this sort of back to the nature. And then you have this sort of um, environmentalist uh, kind of breed. They're competing with things. I mean, I, I had friends from college who are from Montana and, you know, would shoot a wolf on site, you know, mm -hmm. anywhere just because it's wrecking the cattle rancher's yep. livelihood a little bit in some ways, or it's perceived to. Now that's yes. not necessarily always the case, but it's a complicated problem. So it anyway, very complicated. but it's anyway. an interesting biological story. It is. So, you know, they reintroduced the wolves and, and what they found um, after the wolves established themselves in several packs and they did very well is um, th that the beaver population had returned to Yellowstone National Park. And oh really? You'd think you know. Now yeah, that's weird. I, okay, I, I, all right. Explain this. That's really weird. You know, it's it's a uh, it's what what they call in biology a trophic cascade, um, where you know you, one thing in the food chain affects another, and it just cascades down the line or up the line, whichever way you want to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. And and so um, anyway, this is this is what happened is uh, you know over, with the extinction of of the wolves in that part of the of the country. Um, the elk uh, were able to adapt to that. They, they just kind of hung out in the river valleys and, and uh, ate the willows, and the willows were the main habitat for the beavers. So the and elk so, are a little bit lazy. They're just kind of laying yeah. around with no predators, you know, right. living the good they life on the, the grizzlies, you know, <laughs> right. but that's about it. So the elk, um, they had to change their, their way of doing business. I mean, they, were, they weren't allowed to just hang out in the valleys uh, eating the willows anymore. And so with the reintroduction of the wolves, the elk weren't, weren't eating all the willows along the river. So the willow returned and that's the habitat for the beavers. And so the <laughs> beavers returned to the area. And so it's just this really interesting trophic cascade. But if you, you know, if you had one, a couple places to go in, in Yellowstone, what are they and, and, and why? Okay. This is a very hard question for me to answer, and um, so I'm going to give it my best shot. If I if I'm in the mood, if I if I'm like okay, I want to get away from people, then yeah. I'm going to go Crater Hills, um, which is a really cool hydrothermal feature. That there's no trail that leads to it. You just kind of have to bushwhack to it. So you need a map, and you might be the only set of boots that are back there all year long. It's that remote of an area. But I, I will say this that. Uh, my favorite place to hike in Yellowstone is a, is a, is a peak called Avalanche Peak. Hmm. Um, it's a steep, a rigorous hike. It's not very long, but it is very steep. And uh, you're in the, you know, you're, you're right along the rim of the caldera. Uh, you're outside of the caldera, though, so you're in these higher mountains that kind of surround uh, the, the majority of Yellowstone. And it's just a, 
amazing views, 360s all the way around. It's just, uh, it's it's my favorite place. Yeah, I think the only time I've ever done that hike was was in high school um, on on this trip. And, you know, it's just such an amazing place. It's one of those sort of uh, awe-inspiring places where you get a sense for the scale of the things, the processes that are going on in the geosciences as you're sitting basically on the rim of this caldera, which is, you know, 40, what is it, 40, 45 miles wide or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're just, it, it's amazing the scale of it and you can really get a sense of it just sitting there looking at it. <laughs> yep. Uh, so it I, it's, it's super cool place. That's a super cool is. place. Yeah. Um, so that would be me. What about you, Jess? Where's your favorite? Yeah. I think one of the, one of the ones that really has always struck me is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Um, this is where you've got the upper and lower falls. And, and I think that, I believe it's the lower falls that are the, the larger of the two that, um, are, what, like a couple times the size of Niagara Falls. It's just massive waterfalls, right? Um, and they're also flowing through this really uh, yellow rock <laughs> uh, because it's this this eruptive uh, stuff called rhyolite, which is a rock that, that was erupted as part of this caldera-forming volcanic eruption. But it's been altered, hydrothermally altered. So it kind of has this yellowish tinge. It's very beautiful. It has There's like red, uh, oranges, some probably like other color names that I don't really know. <laughs> but but a really cool uh, spectrum of colors. Um, in the in the walls of the of this valley uh, along with this big you know i think it's, it's the yellowstone river that flows through there yellowstone river yeah, yeah. so yeah. Uh, along the the path of the yellowstone river as it goes through over some of these big waterfalls that it's just a stunning place there's some beautiful it overlooks is. it's again pretty popular mm-hmm. spot so it gets busy Very but popular. there's a re- but you there's can a- easily get away from people there though right just get on the trail and uh go out to artist point and you know you can get away from people and and see it it's it's an amazing place i agree with you the canyon is so impressive that as a kid, I, I always had a hard time distinguishing between the Grand Canyon in Arizona and the Yellowstone Grand Canyon. You right. Know? Like the, <laughs> it's just a, it's a big <laughs> yeah. canyon. It's impressive. I love that place. Oh, it's so, amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So back to the National Park. I mean, yeah. on this, on, on the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, okay, it's Yellowstone. That seems to be a little bit self-explanatory, um, but it's not necessarily, you know, definitive where the original came name came from. Right, yeah. So they, you know, there are two theories on why it's called Yellowstone. Um, one, I don't know. Are here are the two. One of them is that they're named for these yellow sandstone boulders along the Yellowstone River outside of Billings, Montana. And the other one is that you know the the vast majority of the rock inside the caldera in Yellowstone is this yellow rhyolite. And right. uh, so to me that version of of why yellowstone is named what it is makes more sense but this, so that's it's the bit, one i go with but <laughs> yeah it's a bit of a nicer tale as well yeah. right and there's also uh, some yeah. really cool um you know native american names land of the burning ground land of vapors many smoke you know smoke from the ground all these kind of things that mm-hmm. uh, are, are really evoke um a really kind of spiritual um right. perspective on this place which it was um yeah and then and then it became a national park in i think 1870s is that right 1872 i, I believe yeah 1872 okay yes um yeah. and so it became a, na- uh, a national park at that point uh but what we're we are really here to talk about is uh, the geosciences behind it what yeah. is yellowstone yeah so you know yellowstone is uh it's called a super volcano. You know, there, there are several different kinds of volcanoes. And then you have these these kind of volcanoes that are, I guess, biblical when they erupt, right. you know, <laughs> cataclysmic. Um, and so they get they get their own category and it's it's called a super volcano. You know, they affect everything, no matter where you are in terms of the weather and, um, you know, the, yeah. the kinds of summers and winters that you get. They're just these are at a crazy scale. These things are going to put so, so much ash it, into so, the atmosphere that it's going to yeah. cool the earth by a little bit. Which right? is one of the things, right? Like if you're if you're in Yellowstone. And this is when I think back to the history of these early people that recognized Yellowstone for what it was. I mean, these people, they knew that Yellowstone, something w- down below was shoving rocks up. And they, they knew that this was eruptive. They recognized it as being this massive, massive volcano. And that's amazing to me because I, I think like <laughs> if I didn't have the knowledge that I had, would I be able to look at Yellowstone, stand on the rim of the caldera and recognize it for what it is? Like, I don't know. No, I, I mean, I know me. for sure. You're too much of a dumbass to be able to figure that yeah, out. That's, there's that's no true. way. That is, no, and there's I, no way. I, there's no way, right? It, no. These people were amazing. Oh, yeah, totally. These early people who, who sat around and thought about this stuff and came up with these <laughs> ideas that are right. unbelievable. Yep. Super cool. Yeah. 
you can easily recognize that Mount St. Helens is a volcano. Right, I mean, right. Anybody can can recognize that. Absolutely. Right? Yellowstone is so big, you can't see across the caldera. You know, so the, it's, it's a 30 by 45 mile, mile caldera. So it's not exactly circular. It's, it's kind of eyeball shaped or oblong shaped, you know, sure. but um, for them to recognize what Yellowstone was and not being able to like see that was, is, it's amazing to me. Yeah, it's and amazing. I have a lot of respect it, for that. And yeah. you can't, it's not immediately recognizable, but it mm-hmm. is this massive super volcano. And this is the, the, the remnant of a super volcano. It's not a crater because there's a slight difference between a crater right. and a caldera, but it's basically right. this massive magma chamber emptied out during a huge eruption, like a catastrophic, mm-hmm. globally catastrophic eruption. And then the rock, the, the layers of rock above that empty magma chamber just kind of collapsed down into itself. And that's what creates this massive ring. Um, yep. So it, it, it's, it's a stunning, the scale of this thing is stunning and super cool. So if you're going there, hike Avalanche Peak, sit there, look at the look back at Yellowstone, uh, and you're looking towards the center of, you know, where all this magma came from, and then the ground just collapsed beneath it because so much volume had been extruded out into the atmosphere. Um, right, right. So what generates this thing? I mean, what's the what's the source of all this activity? So Yellowstone is uh, sits over top of where Yellowstone geographically is sits over top of what is called a hot spot in geology. There are some famous hot spots. Um, there's Hawaii. There's you know there's a hot spot beneath Iceland. But obviously Hawaii is very different from Yellowstone. And and, and when you, that's kind of what we want to talk about today in terms of why that is. But so first of all, what is a hot spot? I guess the way that that I explain it to my kids is I I will often I'll I'll take a lighter, okay, like a cigarette lighter, and I'll have a kid, one of my students, um, come up in front and light yeah. the lighter, and I'll say, all right, this this lighter is the hot spot, right? Mm-hmm. So say, so, all right, basically keep your hand still, and the and the lighter's lit, and I'll take a piece of paper, and I'll just move that piece of paper slowly over the lighter, right? And, and then, it, you know, what will happen is, is I move it over the course of that 11-inch long piece of paper, is it'll burn a hole through it, you know, and I'll quit blow the hole out, you know, so I'm, you know, yeah, blowing the yeah, thing out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then, um, and then I'll keep moving it and another hole will erupt through and I'll blow that out and so on. And it, but in the end, I hold the paper up and you can see the scorched paper where the, where the cigarette lighter burned a, a, a trail, wherever that piece of paper, went, it burned a trail on the bottom side of that paper. Right. Yeah. And then periodically it erupted through and, and burned a hole through the whole piece of paper. So, yeah. So the, so the, so the piece of paper in this analogy is the tectonic plate. That is just, yes. you know, it, this is the, if you bend it, it will break a piece of the earth that yes. it, it slides over top and, and, and the hot spot is locked, you know, down. It's, it's really anchored deep in the mantle. Um, so the source of this heat and, and, and magma coming up is locked in place and the plate is just sliding over. So you, hopefully you've never lit a student on fire with this little exercise. Have you? No, not really. Okay. No, not nothing bad. Nothing. Bad. <laughs> no, so, nothing, nothing to write home about. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so then from this blob of hotspot at the base of the lithosphere is strands of magma rise up into the lithosphere to much shallower, much closer to the surface of the earth. Yep. And they create these magma chambers then uh, in the sh- in the in the crust, literally within the crust, they're fed by a by a, a, a plumbing network that connects straight back down to the hot spot. So they get injected with magma from the massive hot spot at the base of the lithosphere, and it is these shallow magma chambers that cause the eruptions that we see at the surface. Okay, these super eruptions. Right. I mean, Yellow- so- Yellowstone is the end member. Yellowstone is the it does not erupt often and when it goes it goes massively that's that's the end it's the end member on our planet at the moment from what we right. know of like i mean in the case of you said one of your favorite places is canyon uh, canyon is one of the places w- the yellowstone grand canyon where the hot spot is at its shallowest there it's it, the top of the the that shallow magma chamber there is ma- in places only one and a half miles below you, where you're standing right when you're at canyon and that's a to me that's amazing i mean that's that's right there at the surface of the earth you know and yellowstone is actually quite flat that's right um w- at least when you get inside the majority of the park is you're inside the caldera 
Um, and so why is Yellowstone quite flat? Yeah, so so this brings up an interesting story. I mean, I, I, this is something that's stuck with me since high school. Um, is I don't know if you remember this, Chris, but I, we were in Yellowstone, so we were camping in Yellowstone. Then we're driving to Craters of the Moon National Park was the, the sort of next stop. Um, and so we're driving the bus, you know, we got this, we're on this summer science trip with whatever, 25 high school students, you, another teacher, both your families, and you're driving the bus. And I got a little bit bored in the back. Um, and so I came up to the front of the bus. I think I sat on the steps, right? And you're right next to you. And I just started peppering you with questions. I, and you must've been so freaking annoyed by me, but I mean, I was just like, all right, trying to just talking, right? Just chatting it up. Cause you were the source of, of geoscience knowledge at that point. So I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Right. Um, anyway, so we're talking about this we're driving through the snake river plane towards craters of the moon and you're just asking me questions. You're like, really, I think you, I don't know what you're doing at the time, but you were trying to push my knowledge a little bit. Um, and you're like, all right, Jesse, we're driving through this Valley, this big Valley, look on either side. Like there's mountains over there. There's mountains over there. There's, there's no mountains in front of us. There's no mountains behind us. What did we just leave? And what are we headed to, right? And we had just left Yellowstone and we were just headed to Craters of the Moon, which is another volcanic, you know, eruption, but this is effectively the remnants of the hotspot. And I sat there for, a, I don't know how many hours it was, but it was hours, not minutes. Um, and I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> and this drove me crazy. I, 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 you, you eventually had to give me the answer. Um, and and that I? kind of- a, I don't remember that. that yeah, so you, you eventually had to give me the answer because I couldn't figure it out. Um, and it, and it drives me crazy to this day. It, those of you out there who, who know me, you know I'm a little bit stubborn, perhaps. And also, I don't like it when I can't figure things out. So it really, it really kind of irritated me that I couldn't figure that out. And I just I stewed on that for a while. I thought about it for a long time. But this is one of these, again, one of these beautiful things in the geosciences. And this is kind of why we're, we're talking about Yellowstone early on, because it's an amazing, very popular national park. But it also has this really cool geoscience story to it, which is the Snake River Plain, which heads to the south west from yellowstone as we see it mm -hmm. today so let's get into that a little bit because yeah, you brought so, up the I last mean, eruptions in, in yellowstone right. proper but there's a whole long history past that so the snake river plain is just exactly what the name implies right it's relatively flat and it's like 60 miles wide so as you're driving southwest along the snake river plain or west southwest um you like you said you look to your right and you see these mountains you look to your left you see these mountains and there's nothing in between right but those the mountains on the right and the mountains on the left look a lot alike yeah okay they, right. they look a lot alike well we're driving through these these kind of ridge and valley province kind of mountains you know and and those mountains were you know why are, why aren't they where we're driving on the snake river plain well they were swallowed by the Yellowstone caldera, right. you know, or by the by the Yellowstone hotspot, I should say. That's right. Um, so by, you know, by so previous, you know, iterations of the Yellowstone hotspot or, or the Yellowstone hotspot, which is now beneath Yellowstone, but was previously beneath these parts of, of the North American plate, or yes. rather the North American plate was back shifted to the to the northeast so that it was it's sitting the scorched over. earth. Exactly. Right? I mean, it's a beautiful it's the, it's, it's the piece of paper over the lighter. OK, the, when I first take that edge of the paper and it just touches the tip of the lighter and then it continues to move over it. Right. Where Yellowstone resides right now is the back end of that piece of paper. Right. You know, and and but that hot spot, though, Jesse, this hot spot is 17 million years old. It first e became uh, an eruptive center 17 million years ago, 340 miles away from where Yellowstone is right now to the south southwest. And so that's the track. That's the scorched earth on the piece of paper. The Snake River Plain is the scorched earth of the Yellowstone hotspot. If you leave Yellowstone, you drive along the Snake River Plain to the southwest, you're going into older and older and older rocks that are effectively the same thing as is being erupted in Yellowstone you know, 640,000 or was being erupted in Yellowstone 640,000 years ago. Um, so it's basically the same composition, the same process. It's just a bit older. Yeah. Um, but the, th the thing is, though, that I do want to mention about this is actually so Craters of the Moon is made up of black rock. It's all basaltic lava flows. You get these pohoi hoi and ah ah lava flows and really, really cool stuff and cinder cones and so on. So the eruptive, this, it's still Craters of the Moon National Park is 
you know, most recently, I think erupted 1400 years ago. So very, yeah. very recent geologically, right? And, but it's erupting a completely different style of rock. It's the, it, you know, it's the dregs of a former Yellowstone mm-hmm. that, that is, yes. that is kind of being erupted uh, periodically. And, and, you know, as you, as you head, you know, due west from Yellowstone, it gets more complicated. Mm-hmm. We have what, like 12, 14 something different caldera provinces that as you head from Yellowstone to the Southwest, you, you kind of go into these older and older provinces. So, so if you're going to Yellowstone, you're sitting in Yellowstone, listen to this. Um, you know, if you don't head to Crater of the Moon National Park, you're kind of missing the end of the story in a way. Um, and so, you know, if you don't have time to make it there right now, make sure you go back because it really, you know, kind of finishes the story of Yellowstone. I think um, so. You know, it's, uh, yeah, so yellow, what that means then is Yellowstone will eventually become covered with about six tenths of a mile of black basaltic rock. <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. And there will, but, the, but then there may be a new eruptive center further to the east of where Yellowstone is right now. That's right. Closer That's to right. Michigan. Right? That's right. Where it's kind of progressively as the continent drifts over the hotspot, you know, we're going to start generating, there's going to be a new little straw punched in through the crust mm-hmm. that brings magma up to really shallow levels, starts to generate these massive eruptions, um, in a, in a new place. Um, mm-hmm. In the future, but Yellowstone, as it is right now, three eruptions, you know, last two million years. So that's every whatever, 600,000, 650,000 years, something like that. And mm-hmm. the last one was 640,000 years ago. So a lot of, uh, you know, there's a there's a little bit of a culture uh, built around being worried about Yellowstone erupting mm-hmm. <laughs> because if it does, yeah. it's a problem, right? It's a problem it's... for our economies. It's a problem for anybody living in within several hundred miles, if not on this planet. It's something that if it goes, we're going to, it's catastrophic. It's, as you said, biblical. Um, but 640,000 years ago, okay, are we, Chris, Christopher Bullhuis, are we due for an eruption? No. <laughs> no, no, right? There's exactly. no evidence to suggest that Yellow, there's anything going on in Yellowstone. Uh, this is a media hype. Uh, people love it. You know, everybody, it's so popular for people to say this is overdue, you know. Yeah. But we're talking about a 640,000, you know, that's when it last erupted 640,000 years ago. And uh, it, uh, on a human scale, the likelihood of this, it, this, this isn't, it's not a clock. This isn't like, oh, I got to, okay, it's been, I have to keep this cycle. That's not the way it goes. Right. Um, there hasn't, there's, there's no indication scientifically that there's anything going on uh, outside of the normal in Yellowstone National Park. Right. And so there's so many interesting things we could talk about with Yellowstone. Um, and, and this is perhaps one of them is, is sort of, you know, volcano prediction, volcano monitoring, all this stuff. Because there's all sorts of stuff being thrown at Yellowstone to sort of actively monitor it in real time mm-hmm. to see what the heck is this volcano doing. It's really interesting because volcanoes are really dynamic. Even when they're not erupting, they're like breathing in and out. Mm-hmm. They're they're giving off gas plumes. They're kind of spouting off a little bit. Then they kind of go dormant for a while, get really quiet, lay down, settle down, take a long nap. You know, they do all these really interesting things in the lifetime of a volcano. They're really active, dynamic features. Um, but on the time scales of human society. Uh, we don't need to be concerned that Yellowstone is going to erupt tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a, f- a the- number of years ago, there was a, a ranger put a, a, he's a friend of mine. He put up a sign in Yellowstone national park on the Northern end of Yellowstone Lake by fishing bridge, somewhere near fishing bridge. It's a place that's it's, I think it's called the sour Creek dome and it was the most rapidly rising area in the world. <laughs> okay. So we put up a sign and said, this is the most rapidly rising area in the world. Yeah. A couple of years later, I had to take the sign down because then it started to deflate and was actually right, right. sinking and just, you know, so. <laughs> and that's right. This is, this is these volcanoes, you know, breathing in and out over. Tuffing you know, and ru- puffing all the time. Uh, yeah, exactly. And super cool. Yeah. Real quick. I want to run these down. The, so 2 million years ago, it was about 2,500 times the size of Mount St. Helens. Uh, about 1.3 million years ago was only 280 times the size of Mount St. Helens only. And uh, 640,000 years ago was about a thousand times bigger than Mount St. Helens. So, um, yeah, you know, in any one of those are are just a a scale that, you know, hasn't been witnessed ever by a human. You know, that's that's an interesting thing. These no human has ever seen a super volcano erupt. And and they're hard to track. It's really hard to to understand what would the effects be at a global scale mm-hmm. uh, of this eruption because it's been a right. long time. I just come to the conclusion, Jesse, that I, I don't think I'd want to just stay. If I like, if I had any precursor that Yellowstone's going to go, I think I'll just take my kids, my my, my family, and we're just going to go sit on the caldera. Yeah, you might as well, right? Mount St. Helens. You, right? you tried this once upon a time, Mount St. Helens, and you know it didn't work <laughs> out for you. But maybe someday you'll be able to die in a Yellowstone eruption, there, Chris. <laughs> I, I actually hope not, but I'm just saying that. Yeah. you know. 
That would be yeah, you'd rather you'd rather die in the eruption than live through the apocalypse, right? Right, um, right. Yeah. You know, it's just a it's a special place, um, and I, I hope that you know, knowing a little bit about geology to me, and what what one of the things that I want to convey in this podcast then is that knowing a little bit about geology is an excuse to go see things that that strike you as interesting. That's you right. Know? That's right. So if you're sitting at home, you've never been to Yellowstone, go. It's yep. definitely worth the trip. Be a three percenter, right? Yeah, that's right. Go someplace where there is no boardwalk and, uh, and, and explore safely um, and, and responsibly. But, you know, explore and take care of it because these national parks are our treasure and they're beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, well, so with that, I think we're, we're going to wrap it up. And, uh, you know, uh, stay tuned. We're going to be talking about some things that uh, in the geosciences related to COVID and when we basically shut down our economy for, for a couple of weeks <laughs> and everybody stayed home uh, and, right, yeah. and some positive news from that. So. Yeah. Sounds good, Jesse. All All right. right. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll talk to you later.